Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to day three, talk session five on new Galaxy tooling. I'm Stephen Manos. I'm going to be the MC for this session. Um, and we have um, Alex and Tyler um, speaking up first from Hopkins University. Thanks. All right, I'm Tyler. I'll be talking about Alex uh, on our, we're talking with Alex about our work on a single cell spatial omics pipeline uh, and some of the advancements we've been using from the IWC workflows and how to implement it. So if people aren't familiar with uh, single cell uh, experimental design, it's essentially trying to capture transcriptome information from within single cells and is used very often for identifying cellular subtypes. It's often a pretty common experiment at this point. It gets fairly high use on Galaxy. Uh, very often you'll see it used in drug design experiments where you're trying to determine a drug effect across a variety of cell types, or if you're trying to determine changes in a tumor microenvironment, for example. Um, additionally, while I've been working on it, there have been a lot of advances in the field. So one of the big changes that happened recently is the include or introduction of spatial omic data into it. So rather than just being able to look at single cells um, in an aggregate sense across an entire tumor, they have now included high resolution tissue imaging data and have a couple experiments that focus on that. You're able to combine that high resolution tissue imaging data along with uh, single cell transcriptome information. And you can combine those two pieces of information to give yourself a three dimensional cellular atlas in a way. So you can look at how those cell types are aligning, for example, in a tumor microenvironment in three dimensional space. And it'll give you a good indication of how those cells are aligning correctly. Uh, if you have certain immune cells clustering around different cancer type cells, changes in gene expression in certain areas of that tumor, and it's very useful for tissue uh, analysis. However, when it comes to workflows, we've had uh, several problems with trying to create them. Most of the single cell data uh, and input data types are very non-standardized and very diverse. And as a result, it makes it very confusing to try and have an input workflow. This problem's only been confounded with the inclusion of spatial omic data and several of the other advances um, that have been going on in the field. And as a result, we've been working together to try and use some of the new advances that have been introduced into the workflow editor within Galaxy to try and make a more general workflow that'll be helpful for other people. And I'll pass off to Alex to talk about that. Thank you, Tyler. So the IWC exists to have standardized workflows that are available for everybody to uh, focus on each of their types of analysis, which is great. We have dozens available, variant calling, the VGP has, uh, has all of ours up there, epigenetics. But the non-standard uh, approach to single cell um, sequencing makes this really difficult to have a standardized single cell workflow on the IWC because you might be coming in with 10x data, you might be coming in with other formats of data, you might have different analyses you want to continue with, and that's going to require different workflows uh, each time. Um, currently, we have a bunch of single cell workflows available from Galaxy Training, and we have a few that are being uh, put into a few workflows that are being put into the IWC at the moment. Um, but again, these are not going to be catch all cases where anyone can just bring their data and start running it. So to that end, uh, the enhancements that have been uh, that Marius highlighted earlier uh, that have been made to the workflow uh, in two workflows in galaxy can be used to create much larger and more complex workflows. So direct input parameters, conditional uh, parameter inputs, parameter mapping, and parameter generation based on inputs allow for what we're starting to call uh, meta workflows, where you can have domain entire workflows where you choose a path. So currently, we are working with SquidPy, as Titer mentioned. Um, and SquidPy is a, a tool made by the Cybers team, which uh, does spatial omics analysis after a um, 10x basic uh, single cell RNA analysis. However, a user might come in and have a different uh, analysis direction they want to go to. They don't have their 10x data. So this is an example with uh, SquidPy, where you come in and we ask you immediately, do you have spatial omics data available? And if the answer is no, we can hand you off immediately to one of the existing training workflows, uh, at, or if you do, we can ask you, please input the specific SquidPy data type that we have implemented, which is Visium data, um, and give you an entire different workflow. Uh, so this 
can evolve further into full domain uh, areas, not just single cell, where what type of data, we ask you at the beginning, what type of data do you have, what direction do you want to go, do you want to continue a workflow, uh, or do you want to terminate early, such that a user can, um, can basically design their own workflow as they go. Um, as I mentioned, this allows for domain workflows. This also allows for project workflows. So with the VGP stuff we've been working on, it means that depending on what type of data you bring in, you can run a different version of the, of the VGP analysis that has already been uh, discussed earlier um, and come out with uh, proper results. Uh, we wanted to say thank you to everybody who's been working on, on this, the IWC team especially. Marius, thank you for all of your help on all of this. And I uh, would like to ask for any questions. Bjorn? Following a little bit the squid pie <laughs> development, we, we see a lot of strange tools coming to Galaxy that are really have unstructured outputs and very complicated outputs. Do you see any way how we can yeah, approach upstream to make those tools in general more user-friendly, independent of Galaxy or not? So currently, the Visium uh, input data is a large folder that involves multiple and data, uh, and data files and a bunch of image files. So the inclusion of uh, non-standard format uh, inputs for like inputting an entire directory as a single data object that doesn't have to be worked on by a user beforehand uh, allows for a much more diverse downstream experience if a user doesn't, if, if a user can pull in the input folder that they pull from somewhere rather than having to uh, know how to tar gzip, which is what we have to do for Visium going in. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next up is Julia from the University of Edinburgh. Thank you. Um, all right, so hi again. Um, today I'm going to tell you about what I've actually done as a newcomer. Um, and uh, that was um, introducing new monocle free tutorials for trajectory analysis in single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, so I'm glad that. Um, oh, it doesn't. Uh, I'm glad that single cell um, uh, sequencing was already introduced. So um, having this um, gene expression on the level of individual cells, we can actually group them uh, based on this expression patterns and identify the um, cell types. And trajectory analysis is basically answering the question, how are those cell types related to each other? And in order to do so, a trajectory analysis computes um, pseudotime, which basically measures how the cells progress through um, biological um, transition. And it's very useful for studying differentiation and development of cells, as well as um, different cell fate decisions, how those are made. But it's important to know that um, not all trajectory inference methods um, can be used to oh sorry can be used to infer all kinds of biological processes, and this slide explains why. Um, as you can see, there are lots of um, trajectory inference methods, and those use various algorithms behind to compute, uh, to calculate um, pseudo time, and having this, this various methods. Um, we need to compare the results so that we can make sure that our results are actually accurate and make biological sense. However, in our single cell case study tutorial series, we only had one method which used ScanPy. Um, but in, um, in the field, the gold standard is monocle free. And actually, it turned out that we had lots of monocle free tools in Galaxy Toolship that no one has used in tutorial. So this is why I decided to step in and I developed two tutorials based on Monocle Free. 
and a slide deck to reinforce learning. Um, and I want to show you the example from real life, how important it is to have different methods to assess the reliability of the analysis. So here you can see um, the cell types uh, plotted using ScanPy and Monaco. Um, that's from the differentiation, from the development of T cells. And this graph shows the pseudo time calculated by Monaco. And I want to draw your attention to this um, cluster that branches out from the main trajectory. But this actually wasn't seen in pseudo time calculated by ScanPy. So that made me think if this branch is an artifact or have I discovered a new cell type? Um, so I decided to check that out. I checked all the gene markers and a couple of weeks later, I discovered that it was just a batch effect. Um, so as you can see here, after applying batch correction um, on this data set, this weird branch just disappeared. However, I had to do it in Monocle in R because simply the batch correction function hasn't been wrapped into Galaxy tool yet, as well as some other functions that are available in Monocle in R but are not available as Galaxy buttons. And that inspired me to extend this first tutorial that I firstly developed, which aims at users who prefer to interact with Galaxy interface instead of um, coding. Um, so then I just reproduced the same tutorial using the same uh, data set to allow users on different levels to, to perform the same analysis basically and um, open the doors to extend learning. And here is a quick shout out to people who um, introduced the automatically generated Jupyter Notebooks feature because it was super helpful in creating this tutorial, made work um, much easier and quicker. Um, and here, I, by introducing those two new uh, tutorials, I really wanted to highlight how we can use the full potential of Galaxy just in one tutorial series and basically just in one data set. Um, so here is how we can take user from um, curated tutorial oriented data um, just to introduce the user to the topic, then um, to get a step further and introduce the user to more um, difficult uh, to analyze data, but still using um, Galaxy buttons. And then um, by having a trajectory analysis method, which is maybe more advanced um, analysis, user can choose either the way, which is easier, but more um, restricted with Galaxy buttons, or um, there is an optional um, tutorial which takes the user through the whole analysis um, on advanced um, level. And um, obviously I just want to um, thank all the institutions and people who made it possible for me to create those tutorials. And with those um, key, uh, key points, I um, want to um, uh, yeah, open the, the floor to any questions that you might have. So let's move into a little bit different field uh, of science. So let's move to mass spectrometry. Um, a mass spectrometer can qualitatively or quantitatively determine the presence of basically any molecule in a sample. And so we use this to measure the composition of samples or to determine presence and absence of specific chemicals. And um, how we do this with a very specific type of uh, instrumentation for which the software is suitable. Um, what we do is we compare fragment, so spectra from fragmentation events, which we induce in the mass spectrometer. Um, 
and we can identify what kind of compound we are measuring and fragmenting by comparing it with a spectral library. So there are stuff that we have measured before, like we measure the standard, we know what it is, we observe the experimental data, we store it so that we can use it later. This is possible because this type of instrumentation provides very reproducible and reliable data. Um, the mass spectrometer is usually coupled to a chromatography, so this adds a different dimension, apart from the mass, to our data, which is time. Um, and from time, we can compute a certain index, and this is called the retention index. So, in the end, we have basically two dimensions which we can use to identify our data, which is the mass to charge ratio and the peaks that we have from the signal and the time domain. So we start with the raw data, we do some pre-processing magic and we pull out spectra, which we believe coming from, which we believe come from a single molecule. We compare them to our library and by comparing it to something that we already know, we find out the structure of this specific um, compound. How do we do this comparison? Well, we use this match mass package um, to compute mass spectral similarity. There are many softwares out there that do this. They do it in a little bit different way. But in the end, what it always comes down to is you need some form of quantization of your data because comparing vectors in a continuous space is not really possible. So we kind of need to bin our spectra to um, a fixed length vector, which we are then comparing. We can use different methods for this, and then we can compute the score between those, which can be basically the cosine angle between this vector, right? We could also use Manhattan distance or whatever similarity metric we wish to use. Um, based on the score, we can then say, okay, these spectra are actually matching or not. So this match mass package takes two sets of mass spectrometry of, of mass spectra compares a scoring matrix between those, and then from that you can continue your, your analysis. Um, so what we did is we implemented a bunch of Galaxy tools based on this package. Um, and this is just to highlight like the functionality that we use. So um, mass spectral libraries or the unidentified mass spectra are represented in the format that you can see on the top left. Um, so it's usually a text-based format, which is not really standardized. So this library tries to push standards, etc. cetera. Um, but basically it comes down that you have a metadata section and a peak section. And so you can filter libraries based on the metadata that is in it. You can convert it to different formats. You can export all the metadata to use it in different tools. Um, so yeah, this is kind of the, the tooling that you can do around the spectral similarity computation. You can compute the spectral similarity, but you can also compute similarity based on metadata. So for example, you can encode the chemical structure using smile strings and store it in the metadata. And then you can, for example, compute the Tanimoto score between the smile strings to get an actual structural similarity if you're comparing two mass spectra for which you have the structural annotation. Um, what you can then do is you can also do molecular networking on it. So you can just take your scores matrix and basically put it into a network where the connection between the nodes is determined by the score. So the spectral similarity of these nodes. Um, and this you can then actually download and take out into software that is dedicated for this, such as Cytoscape, um, or you can also use it in MatGem as far as I know. Um, we also implemented a, a wrapper for machine learning based scoring. This is kind of like a topic for itself. Um, and yeah, you can format the output results, etc. Um, how the scores are implemented is this is done in a very flexible way. So this supports sparse computations and um, NumPy arrays. And this is just to make this scalable because you can have very large reference libraries. Um, and in this way, you can compute your score between basically arbitrary amounts of data. So with this, I would like to come to an end. Um, I would like to acknowledge um, the Czech uh, Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports, which is making this work possible, and Elixir for funding us to come to this conference. Thank you very much. And now we have time for questions. Thank you. Okay. We have time for one question, maybe two. All right.
Any questions? <laughs> Thank you, Bjorn. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next up is Andrew from the Peter McCallum Cancer Center in Victoria. Thank you. Thank you, Vami. We've got a lot of slides, so let's go quick. This is Fast QC. Everyone's probably seen it for assessing quality of sequencing data. This is Fast QE, which is better because it does the same thing but with emoji. <laughs> So the question you're asking is, why does that even exist? <laughs> Let's go back to a parallel session at PyCon in 2016. I'm speaking in the middle. To the left of me, there's a talk about bioinformatics. To the right, talk about emoji. I wish I could have gone to the other talks. By the end of my talk, maybe my audience might feel the same way. <laughs> so what do I do? I did a one more thing where I combined everything that was happening. My love of side projects, bioinformatics and emoji. We look at FastQ data, which we encode scores in ASCII characters. Why use ASCII characters? Let's use emoji instead. And then my last slide was all, let's do something typical, you know, semi-realistic. Let's do the average quality in a couple of sequencing files represented with emoji. And that should have been the end of it, really. <laughs> I got a support request. <laughs> I put it on Twitter and I said, oh, it'd be good for education and public talks. My friend is like, no, Andrew, finish your PhD. <laughs> And it was hard, it was hard, I'll admit, but I have a brilliant solution where I think of some excuse to work on it and then I work on it, but that's all I did. And so we've kind of limited it to once a year, I kind of do something with this every year, put it on PyPy, take the GZ files, and it's going pretty well until, you know, now you ask, why is it on Galaxy? So once a year, but then, pandemic happened and we had BCC 2020, which was half BOSC and half GCC. And so I spoke about it and said, please contribute to FastQE so I don't have to, to try and build up the community so it's not just me. But actually I was speaking in a parallel session with a Galaxy talk. So I did a one more thing, which was, oh, would this work on Galaxy? And that could have been the end of it there as well. But then we had CoFest and then Helena wrote a wrapper for Galaxy. Maria started doing some training materials and so suddenly the once a year development approach has then become a galaxy um, story. So it got put in, in, the wrapper was put in, then got added to the GTN. Then the last couple of smorgasbords, um, FastQ's been in there, one quote I love, the silent hero was FastQE. But it can get better. So FastQE doesn't have a HTML interface. So the wrapper is very elegant. It does a lot of heavy, heavy lifting with said, and it wraps the output into HTML with that line down the bottom there. And that's the report you get in Galaxy at the moment. So can I improve it? Well, there's one more version that then is um, linked to the wrapper. There's some custom options that aren't in there. And the tutorial makes it clear that you use FastQE for short reads, but it's not gonna work for long reads. And that was a bit of a challenge for me. <laughs> so, Galaxy inform design. There's a HTML output. You know, HTML is rich, it's interactive, and it needs to work with long reads. So this is the new interactive report. I wonder if this video will work. Yes, it is. So the new version is a lovely interactive report. There's a mouse over. You can see the maximum, the minimum, and the mean at the same time. You can go through, and you can see at the end, the quality gets to those emojis, and you get some sequencing information as well in the new version. So it makes the wrapper simpler. You have to enable HTML because there's a lot of JavaScript going on there but the code's a lot cleaner. As I said, you've got um, those tips there, and then the window option now makes it work with long reads, so we can summarize in the bottom here and really collapse long, long reads and compare short and, and long, which might be good from an educational point of view. Um, now that there's a HTML report, it's not just Galaxy. So look out for multi-QC in the future, where FastQE is gonna be in there as well. So my summary is that improving FastQE for Galaxy has actually just made it better. It simplified the development and now it'll be easier to add new features and to, um, to extend the training network um, materials to maybe put it in a few more places. Um, so I'd just like to thank everyone that contributed during CoFest and, and put the wrapper on there. Alicia for indulging me when I said I wanted to come up here and talk about it. Um, and I've gone pretty fast, so I've probably got time for one more thing. Um, 
So back in CoFest, we kind of went back to another idea, which was originally I said, could we convert a file into FastQ rather than summarizing the quality? And so out of CoFest came Biomojify. So instead of just summarizing, we can now convert files completely to an emoji format. So if you ever looked at FastQ format, that's arguably easier to read than what's going on. And why stop with uh, DNA? So you could do it with proteins or even variants, which I can, you know, maybe pass off actually related to my work in cancer. So Biomodify exists. And now I'm thinking, could we get that on Galaxy as well? So all the things I'm talking about today, I'm thinking about the Biomodify and maybe might see you next year and we'll talk about that. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Do I have time for questions? We've got time for one question. Anton. Can I stop here? Um, what about cigar strings? That is a great idea. The only thing stopping me is funding. So if anyone wants to fund it, please come and talk to me after this. That would be great. Also, BAM files. I've got ideas about that. And, yeah. and file genetic trees. It actually works really well. But yeah, anyway, yeah. It can't be stopped. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And next up, we've got Nate from Penn State University. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, it's going to be a tough act to follow, but I'll give it a try. Um, so I'm talking today about the Intergalactic Data Commission. This is a project been worked on by a number of my colleagues um, and I. And uh, what are we talking about with the Intergalactic Data Commission? Whoop. Uh, we're talking about reference data. And so, of course, the first question you're going to ask is, what is reference data? And this is anything in Galaxy that is going to be expensive to pre-compute um, or, and or, it's going to be reused a lot, uh, or it will consume a lot of space. So the canonical example for this is uh, a, a genomes and the various indexes that you have to build for different tools. So um, you might be surprised to learn that, for example, BWA, Bowtie2, HiSat2, Star, all these things. They all have different indexes uh, that have to be built for each genome that you want to make usable. So you have to have the genome file itself, then you have to build these indexes that are specific to the tools. Occasionally you run across something that uses a different tools index, which is nice, but that doesn't happen very often. Um, and so why do we want to uh, do something special with this reference data? Well, just to take as an example, GRCH38 uh, build of human genome. Um, if you look, we have uh, in, in our copy of, of Galaxy, we've got three uh, different versions of this. I don't really know what they are, but um, canonical, female, full. And each of these genomes, the FASTA files are three gigs, which is not really that much. Um, and then you can see we've got different indexes, and this isn't even all of them. It's Bowtie 2, the old Bowtie, whatever. Um, each of those indexes are, in fact, larger than the genomes themselves. Uh, in fact, all the way up to BWA math index, which is 17 gigs. And the star index is also generally very large, much larger than the genome. Um, in total, the HC38 then uh, uh, folder is, is uh, containing about 80 gigs. And so you can imagine with your 250 gig quota in Galaxy, you don't want people to be making lots and lots of copies of that. I mean, not just for their own space, but of course, uh, you as a Galaxy administrator don't want all that that many copies of the data. So we've been able to deal with reference data in Galaxy pretty much from the very beginning. It's stuff that you just have on disk that you make available through, through the Galaxy UI in the tool form. So you can see you select this option in, in HiSat2 in this case to use a built-in genome. You can pick which one it was or which one you want. And if your thing isn't in there, you do this nebulous sort of contact the Galaxy team thing, whatever that means. So uh, originally you had to hand build this, then in, in 2014, Dan uh, added Galaxy Data Managers, and Data Managers are special tools that uh, you can run to do all of that uh, heavy lifting that you previously had to do yourself um, automatically through Galaxy as a special admin only tool. So this is great for, for fetching those reference genomes, for building all those different indexes, and it's also great for non-genomic tools as well. It doesn't have to be genomic data, although that's what we talk about a lot. 
Um, and data managers install the data into your Galaxy server, wherever you run them. So uh, if you're looking sort of across the class of different Galaxy servers, um, and so we've got the use galaxy.star servers up here and maybe yours at the end. Uh, how, how do data get updated in these different servers? Well, each, each server probably has a different method, um, some of them more manual or, or uh, less controlled than others. Um, and then what's the process for that data actually being built? Um, you know, EU's got a process, AU's got a process, uh, on org it's kind of broken at the moment. Um, but unfortunately then every, every server is different. At some point I took all of mine, my data that, that we had on usegalaxy.org and we dumped it into a CVMFS repository. And um, so a lot of people use that, but it's also at this point very out of date. <clears throat> so uh, when we're talking about data managers and sharing data between Galaxy instances, what do we get from data managers? Um, we get uh, that, that admins can easily install and build data. Um, they can uh, do this in a relatively uniform way, right? It controls how the BWA index tool gets run. It controls how the Bowtie 2 index tool gets run, uh, the command line arguments and so forth. Um, and they can be used to generate the data that I then later dumped into CVMFS. But the things that we, we can't do with data managers, so data managers are awesome, but the things that we can't do as far as sharing between instances um, go. So when uh, you run a data manager or the admins run a data manager for Galaxy Europe, um, and I run the same thing, we may not actually get the same thing out. Um, we should, but it's not guaranteed. Uh, you're running two separate tools on two completely different infrastructures. Uh, maybe you have a slightly different source of the data or you ran them at different times. Um, you know, UCSE, where we get a lot of our genomic data used to update things silently behind the scenes. I don't know if they still do that, but uh, that can be an issue. So, um, right. Uh, additionally, some of these indexers require a lot of resources to run. And uh, there are manual processes involved in all of these things. So I said, like, our data on usegalaxy.org are fairly out of date, um, largely because there is this manual process that's required. We build it, then I have to dump it over to CVMFS. Um, used to be multiple people who could do this, but now it's pretty much just me. So that's not great. Um, but the biggest issue with this process is you end up with a lot of duplication of both the effort and space. So all of the big galaxy servers want all these model organisms. They want all these indexes for the common tools. Why are we all building them individually for our servers and hosting them and using all that space and spending all that time? So the solution that we've come up with is this project called the Intergalactic Data Commission or IDC. Uh, but if you go and look at our repository, you'll see that the first commit to it was five years ago. Why am I only talking about it now? Um, we've been trying to get it going all these years. So uh, what were the blockers for this project? Uh, we needed to design a usable system for community curation and maintenance of reference data. Uh, we needed adequate compute resources to run some of those really uh, intensive data managers. Um, and we wanted to generate a single a canonical source of data that's reusable by everybody, not just building off of that very sort of old, out of date, hand built uh, repository that I used or, or generated. And I think we needed to admit to ourselves that there were a lot, like we kept on saying, oh, well, we have all these pieces that, that do the things that we need to do, um, but putting them together is a lot of work. So here are the pieces. Um, we, we, uh, have a way for people to contribute to say what they want in the form of GitHub pull requests. We have a system for running long term jobs and reporting on results. That's Jenkins. Uh, we can run data managers programmatically with ephemeris. Uh, we have Galaxy servers actually that we can run our data managers on in, in the form of the used Galaxy servers themselves. They have huge compute backends, um, lots of stuff that can be done there. So, uh, and we have a script to export that to CVMFS. But we had to build all of these pieces, the ones in purple, to actually put the whole thing together. So uh, what did we need? First, we had to define what data needed to go into this, this repository. Um, and we sort of had a, a version of like 
telling ephemeris how to run data managers, but that's not really what humans are interested in. They want to know things like, you know, what's the DOI associated with this data? Uh, where did it come from? What's the source? What's all this information? Which indexers should be run on it? Um, and so Simon came up with this, this format for genomes.yaml. Um, and so we can define what it is that we actually want to run our uh, data managers on. Next step is we have to figure out what we have and what needs to be done. So this seems like maybe a simple problem, but it's actually a little bit more complicated uh, than you might think. And so uh, John Chilton, my colleague, wrote this, this split data managers uh, utility based on work started by Simon that uh, takes the set of everything in that genomes.yaml file, subtracts out the set of things that uh, have histories on usegalaxy.org that we've built them for and figures out, okay, here are the things that are not built that are in the genomes.yaml um, and spit out a bunch of tasks for us to turn over and produce data. The next uh, sort of uh, piece of the puzzle then was <clears throat> that we needed to figure out how to actually automate this, this process of putting all these uh, pieces together. Um, and it turns out we had a fairly useful model for that already because the way that we install our tools on usegalaxy.org, I don't click through the, the admin UI and install tools that way. Uh, we have a GitHub based pool request building system. Um, you know, people submit what tools they want installed. Uh, it runs through in the background on Jenkins and installs them, pushes it out to CVMFS, which is exactly what we want to do with the data. We just need to do something slightly different in that we need to run it directly on usegalaxy.org uh, for the compute resources. Um, we wanted, I won't talk a whole lot about this. We wanted a uh, breakable server rather than using directly against usegalaxy.org, but we want something that we can sort of mess with and not uh, break usegalaxy.org. So we have an ephemeral server that we can stand up, but it uses uh, usegalaxy.org's resources and database so that the stuff has persisted forever. And Mike showed this picture yesterday. There will be a quiz on it at the end. <laughs> Study it. No pictures. Um, I don't, <laughs> I, I put this, I, I love this thing, so I sneak it into every talk that I can. Uh, but it's mainly just to show what, what's possible. But, uh, and it's the infrastructure behind usegalaxy.org. Um, it's not really meant to be uh, uh, readable. <laughs> but what we needed to do was connect the database, which lives in Texas, and the data storage, which lives in Texas and is NFS mounted. Uh, we needed to connect that across the internet to a, uh, the, where the builder runs on an OpenStack cloud in Indiana. And if anyone is a sysadmin, you know you don't send NFS over the, the internet. Um, but we came up with a solution. Um, uh, if, if you haven't heard me evangelize Tailscale, it's a magical VPN solution. Come talk to me afterwards, um, and I will tell you how to solve all your life's problems. Uh, but it, it made it trivial to connect these pieces. We added MinIO min on top of the storage um, as an S3 backend. And then we needed the ability to actually run the data managers, but not have the data be installed into the server where it was running. Um, for this, John uh, wrote um, tool data bundles. So you can run a data manager, but it doesn't install the data, you, and then you can copy it back out of Galaxy. Um, you can export it, and then you import it back into Galaxy, <coughs> a different Galaxy, which is how we then move this stuff over to uh, CVMFS uh, to publish it out to the world. Um, we write it using OverlayFS. I don't know the details on that. Um, but the, so we put all of these pieces together. You can request data today. Uh, we'll work out some of the issues afterwards, but um, yeah, you go to the repository, you make a pull request, and eventually it will end up in a uh, repository that you can mount up on your Galaxy server. You don't even need root um, on your cluster, and um, <clears throat> you can use it. It's distributed around the world uh, through all of these different sites, and you can set up your own Stratum 1 mirror if you want. Uh, that slide is out of order. And so what's left? We need some curators for the data. I'm a system administrator. I don't know what to do with the data. I don't know what should get into the repository. We need scientists to help. Um, 
And finally, so what's with this funny name, the IDC? Well, the IDC is for reference data, what the IUC is for tools, and what the IWC is for workflows. Um, and the IDC is what is a project that, that Simon was fairly passionate about, especially after we solved some of his other problems. Um, he wrote the, the proposal uh, that determined the structure. Um, he wrote this tutorial for the GTN about reference data. And so uh, Tamara tells me he was uh, pretty excited to be part of something as nerdy as the Unigalactic Data Commission, but uh, <laughs> we figured <laughs> We figured in, in remembrance of Simon, we wanted to do something um, to, to remember him by this project that he cared about. So uh, we're calling it the Simon's Data Club. We're cheating on the acronym, that's fine. Uh, so thank you everyone. Uh, go forth and make data. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for that tribute to Simon as well. Um, we've got time for one question. Thank you very much. This looks amazing. Um, does this currently only support like specific data types, so only for genomic data, or can this be scaled to any type of reference data? So it should work with a little bit of extra work on anything that we currently have a data manager for. If it doesn't have a data manager, then someone needs to write one. But it should work on anything that essentially already exists as data table table data in Galaxy. Thanks. And next up, we have Nguyen from the University of Melbourne. Hi, um, so I'm here to talk about uh, some recent changes that were made to Galaxy that make it a little bit easier to fetch protected remote data sources into Galaxy. For example, um, say you have a protected web server, an HTTP web server or a FTP server. Uh, how do you get that data into Galaxy? And if your users are already logged in, can you do that without requiring any more passwords or logging in a uh, logging process? So, uh, so, uh, so to answer that question, uh, first let's look at how Galaxy currently handles data sources. So broadly, it can be divided into uh, two groups. Uh, so URL handlers like general protocol handlers that can um, uh, you know, like HTTP or FTP, or, uh, and more recently, the GA for GH DRS API, for which John Chilton added support for recently. And uh, uh, so that's one group. And then the second group is file sources, which are plugins that you can write for Galaxy and which can interface with arbitrary browsable file sources like uh, Dropbox or a Google Drive or uh, S3 and so on. So um, if you look at the first one, URL handlers, so these are typically the URLs you would paste into the upload dialog box. Uh, and you paste it and then Galaxy faithfully fetches that data. Uh, now, the catch here is that that data usually has to be public. Um, in contrast, uh, file sources are a lot more sophisticated. You can do uh, all sorts of things with it and it's, uh, it's a pluggable system and you have uh, you typically see it as a browsable list of files and you can uh, fetch data into Galaxy from all these various file sources. You can add your own plugins. And very importantly, you can inject things like user preferences or credentials or read data from a vault and send that into that plugin so that the data can be fetched transparently and without any interaction from the user. So, um, so that brings us to the motivation for why uh, we wanted to try and unify these two things. So uh, the Australian BioCommons uh, wanted to find a way to integrate the uh, Bio Platform's data portal with uh, Galaxy Australia and do that in a seamless way. Uh, I think uh, Carolyn talked about this in her keynote address. And basically that data is exposed over uh, the GA for GH DRS API, and uh, it's password protected, so we needed some way to get that data into Galaxy Australia. Um, so what is GA for GH DRS? So the data repository service is a way to map a logical ID 
uh, or to provide a data set with a logical ID that abstracts away the underlying physical location of the file. So for example, your file could be on S3 or HTTP uh, and uh, you just get one single there's URL for that and you can uh, fetch it, you know, you don't need to know where the file is stored. Um, so Galaxy supports DRS, as I mentioned, but only public URLs. And so the work here was to try and figure out a way to unify these two things so they can all take advantage of the kind of features that uh, file sources offer. So, and that's what we did. So we, uh, so we managed to unify these abstractions and now everything is a file source. So what that means is that uh, all of the features that file sources offer are now available to all protocol handlers and they don't just need to be browsable or anything. Everything can take advantage of those features. So as a result of that, you can inject uh, credentials or do any of the things that you can do with file sources. And ad administrators have a lot of fine grained control, uh, control over this process. So for example, uh, different sites can have different uh, credentials injected and also you could uh, have role based restrictions and you can even stop certain sites being downloaded from altogether, you know, parental controls, whatever. So, um, so all these things are possible now. And uh, yeah, so I'd like to uh, uh, acknowledge Uwe Winter, who uh, did a lot of the work to translate the requirements of the BPA data portal into something that we could implement in Galaxy, and also did a lot of the testing. And uh, yeah, so um, that I think in future, we'll be able to do some more interesting things like maybe injecting OIDC tokens and providing single sign-on across uh, services. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Uh, excellent talk. I think you said that DERS URIs are available for public data on main. Is that automatically generated or something that a user has to initiate? Uh, so, um, I, uh, so if you paste a DERS URL, it should resolve it and be able to download from a DERS uh, API server. So that, that should be fairly transparent and that's, that's something that John did and it's available for uh, since I think this release, the latest release. Uh, and uh, in addition, I think he also added functionality to expose, expose Galaxy datasets over DERS, so that now every data set can, Galaxy dataset also has a DERS uh, URL. Uh, I don't quite know how to find that URL yet, though. I know there's a standard, uh, uh, standard URL for it, but I don't know if it's exposed anywhere where you can just copy and paste it. I need to check on that. Uh, one more question from the audience. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Nguyen. Thanks very much. Thanks. And next up we have Michelle from John Hopkins University. Good morning. My name is Michelle Savage. I'm a software engineer in Michael Schott's lab and Johns Hopkins University. And I work in both the Galaxy team and the Anvil team. Um, today, what I'm going to talk to you about is more of a marketing pitch and a refresh of an existing tool called GX Admin, which is for uh, administrators and how it's going to be leveraged and additionally for researchers, um, strategic tool developers, and that sort of thing. And this was a challenge that arose. Yeah, so this challenge. Um, pretty much arose out of um, wanting to empower those types of users to make data-driven decisions based on tool metrics that were either on NewsGalaxy or their own individual instance of Galaxy. So this is an example of a chart um, of some data that's representative of visualization that those types of users would find helpful in making decisions. Um, this chart talks about um, users in a given month by tool, 
for about a 22 month period ending in May uh, 2023. And it's a popularity chart just showing the top 10 tools. And it starts to tell a story about what tools are useful. Um, if you, in this instance, the visualization is on a online notebook platform called Observable. And you can adjust from 10 tools to see all the tools. And as you can see, the story gets a little more complete and we see some patterns um, like an 80, 20 rule or long tail effect where we have a few tools that are used a lot and very and a bunch of tools that aren't used as much. So along with that, um, what we can start to answer becomes still a little subjective. It's not the entire story. You know, you could look at it and say, well, uh, the tools that aren't being used very much should be deprecated. On the other hand, you could say the tools that aren't being used very much should be promoted. So it kind of depends on what your goals are as um, an admin or a researcher. So here's some other charts. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these because there are many, but just to give you an example of some of the types of tools that we're trying to make available instantaneously without having to go through necessarily your network admin, anyone with database access should be able to run these um, alongside Galaxy uh, from the GX admin install uh, complementary repo. So here we have jobs per month, um, total CPU time, and total memory. So yes, so who are these people? <laughs> that need these types of tools, uh, who are cons who's consuming this data really. And it's, as we know, there are different types of users on Galaxy, um, scientists, trainers, tool makers, developers like me, and then admins and researchers, which we're gonna talk about more. And, you know, we all have a variety of different hats that we play. So you might actually see something that, uh, even as not necessarily an admin or a researcher, that might be of need, uh, useful for your role. Um, but on the admin, exclusive admin side, we have everything that covers um, community management to resource management. On the resource, researcher side, we have everything from a PI that might need this information to a professor or an academic. Uh, and the various roles that they might try to accomplish, again, there's a lot of overlap for everyone here, I think, in the room. Um, anything from IT support, resource management, um, resource acquisition, stakeholder support, proving that different tools are working, um, and even strategic tool makers. You know, somebody who makes tools and maybe wants to make something that hasn't been developed yet or make something that's popular better. Uh, and this is just an example of some of the software tools that those types of users use now and are cobbling together to get these kinds of more complex reports. Um, so, complementary repo. So in this example, we found two complementary uh, repositories. These are repositories that aren't in the Galaxy code base, but can run alongside Galaxy. Uh, one is GX admin, uh, which has existed for a while, and the other is use metrics. And GX admin has been around for a while. And so we decided to consolidate the use metrics into that. Um, and it has a steady stream of contributors, it's stable code base. And that process of then, okay, now that we've got everything in the same code base, how do we get the data to run? Um, so in the case of your individual instance of Galaxy, Previously, what you, you would have to do is to download the data from a network admin and then maybe run it alongside. Uh, and there are these various manual steps that we have um, gotten rid of, at least on the research side, but always existed on the uh, admin side. And over here, you can see the process is much more streamlined. It's basically installing GX admin, querying for uh, some key metrics. And you know, there's some new queries now in GX admin, and we anticipate to add more to get some of those tool metric performance tracking information. So then how do we process the data? Um, again, we were in the process of removing some manual steps uh, on the uh, for users, but also for the use Galaxy side, so we don't have to go through um, a network admin. And um, we can alleviate some of their requests. They get a lot of requests. And, um, 
Yep, and so now it becomes a very simple process of installing gxadmin via curl command and uh, querying here in the second box, you can see uh, just gxadmin, the name of the query, and you can also pass parameters. So if you want to um, look at a certain time period or even if you have an instance where you have a server that needs a certain calculation to calculate for memory, um, which happens because of um, different load balances. And if you know that calculation, you can, um, should be soon, this is one is actually not there yet, but you should be soon be able to uh, add a JSON object that will make that calculation for you. So all the data is normalized. So um, yeah, so that is where we are next. And oh, okay, so that's where we are now. And um, are there any questions? And next up is Dan from the Learner Research Institute. Thank you. Great, so uh, once again, um, I'm Dan. I'm here to actually give Jay's talk. Uh, unfortunately, he also had visa issues, so he's unable to attend. Um, and I realize I'm one of the last things holding us from Koala Fest, which means it's great that Jay sent 29 slides for a seven minute talk. <laughs> so, so buckle up, let's go. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a plugin for uh, Jupyter Lab that allows us to actually use Galaxy uh, through a GUI inside of uh, Jupyter Lab notebooks. Hopefully we're, we're all aware of what Galaxy actually is. So it's an open source platform. It allows you to do all these awesome things. I'm sure many of us are also familiar with what Jupyter is. And so if you're not, just very briefly, it's also a really great open source uh, software. Uh, that allows uh, users to interactively write code and do analyses. Um, and so what can we do if we want to um, empower users to get the, the full complement of what you can use inside of Galaxy, inside of uh, Jupyter Notebooks? So that's, that's the, the, the overall arching goal of uh, Jin uh, or Galaxy and Notebooks. So Jin is an open source uh, Jupyter Lab extension um, and so on the back end, it's using uh, Galaxy's BioBlend um, uh, package to interact with the API. Um, and it, it's a, uh, a custom uh, JupyterLab uh, extension interface. And so it gives us actual GUI access, for example, to um, Galaxy tools, data sets, histories, and so forth, um, all within uh, JupyterLab notebooks. So uh, this is the pretty standard looking uh, Jupyter uh, notebook. Uh, what you can see here is that we actually have um, the Jin uh, extension loaded. And so over here on this left-hand side, you can think of this as our, our tool menu, very similar to Galaxy. You can click here to bring up a login widget inside of a new cell inside of Jupyter. Um, and then we have the options to either log in using your credentials, so your email, your username, and your password, or you can log in directly just using your API key. There's a drop-down list where you can select from known servers, or you can provide um, a URL directly to your own, um, your own custom Galaxy instance. Once you log in, it'll tell you you logged in successfully if you remembered your password correctly, and then uh, the tools menu will fill up with tools that have been uh, retrieved from that Galaxy instance. Once you click on a tool, the, a, a um, new cell will appear here. And so this is inside of the Jupyter Notebook itself. And so we have a very similar looking uh, uh, tool form inside of Galaxy. We have our histories over here. We can switch between histories. We can configure our tools. We can drag and drop um, between our history and the Galaxy tool inside of Jupyter Notebook. Um, and we can run those tools directly from within the, the notebook interface. So does this actually work? Um, so we went ahead and uh, ran an analysis, um, mirrored an analysis from the GTN uh, training materials. It, oops, uh oh. Yes, yeah, so we ran an analysis directly from the GTN uh, training materials inside of the Jupyter Lab notebook, just to make sure that we can reproduce things inside of the notebook, just like we can if we're using Galaxy directly. Um, and of course you can, and when you run tools, you get a, a lot of really nice, interesting feedback. 
um, as well as you know, color changing, just like uh, standard Galaxy instance. You can view your results. In this case, we have a uh, Fisher's plot um, in, inside a Galaxy. What are some unique features? You can actually log into multiple Galaxy instances within the same Jupyter notebook. Um, and so in this case, we have logged into Galaxy Main, a local Galaxy server, as well as uh, Galaxy Europe. All the tools will appear over there under their individual section. Um, and so you can see here that we're using a local version of this individual tool. We actually look at um, expanding those data sets. We can actually send those data sets, for example, to uh, Gene Pattern or another plugin with inside of here, or we can send it to a different Galaxy server directly. Um, of course, because you can open up these notebooks that have been shared from other people before, um, maybe you want to run your analysis at a different site, and so you can select from uh, different Galaxy servers that you may be logged into, and they'll refresh the, the form. Um, obviously, any data sets that were not transferred or do not exist there will not uh, automatically be transferred at this point, but the other parameter settings will be correct. Um, if you've shared a notebook with someone, um, it'll save the state, but there's a nice button here to update it to the current logged in user. Um, I'll keep going. And so another really nice thing is because we're using Jupyter Notebooks, um, we can actually select a, an option here and use a uh, variable that's been defined in a different cell inside of Python and directly plug it directly into the Galaxy interface. Um, with uploading, you can upload files from your own computer. You can send them from the, from the uh, Jupyter uh, server itself. But when you go and upload from your computer, it will attempt to use um, a chunked upload uh, based upon the Tusk uh, interface. If that fails, for example, due to cores, it'll send the file first to the Jupyter server and then directly to the Galaxy server. Um, running out of time, so we'll just pretend there's no limitations. Um, and so some of the implementation details, you know, we need a Galaxy server. We're using Python, uh, Node.js. Um, it's built on top of a package called uh, NBTools. Uh, it's a standalone extension that you can install from uh, PyPy, for example, so you can pip install directly into uh, your Galaxy or your Jupyter Notebook. And it's available here on GitHub, on Docker, and so forth. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. We have uh, time for one question. Leon? Dan, do you envision that to have this extension, I don't know, on Google Colab or do you actually want to have that on our Galaxy service as a Jupyter, I mean, inside our Jupyter notebooks in the main Galaxy servers? Yeah, so a really nice thing is that we're actually already working on adding it as an interactive tool inside of Galaxy, so we can launch it directly within Galaxy. You could then automatically configure it with the API key from that Galaxy user that served it in. They can then also log into different Galaxy servers if they wanted to and, and so forth. And so we, we, are, we are developing that currently. Collab, I'm not sure. I haven't played with it too much, but maybe if, it, if it's useful. Thank you again. And thank you to all the speakers for this awesome session. Much, much appreciated. Thank you.